Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 14th CENCOP Global Summit. My name is Ariel Molino with the CENCOP team, and I'm joining from Nairobi, Kenya today. Um, thanks for joining this session. This is Driving Positive Impact Through Corporate Supply Chains. Uh, this session is hosted in collaboration with Unisocial Business, and I will hand it over to Monica French from the YSB team to get us started. Monica, over to you. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Really happy um, to see you here in our session. Uh, thanks for making the time today, whatever time it might be for you today around the globe. Um, and a very warm welcome to our great panelists today. Uh, welcome, Ria. Welcome, Kieran. Welcome, Mathus, and welcome, Kim. Um, you will get a, a more in-depth introduction to them in just a minute. Also, a big warm welcome to my two great colleagues, uh, Joe Bautista, um, who organized this event, who has been tirelessly active um, in, in communication with everybody in the background. So thank you very much, Joe. Um, all of us really appreciate it. And also to my colleague, Saul, um, who will be the main moderator for today. Um, yeah, we are all from Yunus Social Business, um, and I like to say uh, we make social businesses bigger and big business more social. What does that mean? Uh, we scale social enterprises in five countries in the global south with investment and non-financial support. We also work with multinational corporations and support them in their purposeful transformation through social business. We support them in setting up their own social businesses through venture building and entrepreneurship. We run accelerators with them for targeted support through corporate assets, through mentorships, networks, and finances. And we also help them to include social businesses into their value chain. And this one is what we call social procurement. It's where large corporations meet social enterprises and include them into their value chain. It's the practice of corporations of proactively selecting social enterprises as suppliers in their value chains for raw materials, for goods, or for services. We think it's a business critical link between corporations and social businesses that not only benefits uh, corporations and social businesses alike, but that also has the potential to influence that purpose of transformation. Uh, towards a creator, uh, towards a stakeholder economy. We already work with a few corporations on that, um, for example, with Audi, with SAP and Zurich, and we also have a wide network of social enterprises, some of whom are represented here today and who would speak about their perspective on social procurement. So our question today is, what does it take um, to really unleash the potential of social procurement? How does it actually work? Um, how does it create resilience, inclusion, and sustainability through the partnership between corporations and social businesses? And to lead us through that discussion with our great uh, social entrepreneurs, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Saul Park, who is our Global Investment and Portfolio Director. She works really closely with the social businesses in India, in East Africa, and Latin America, and she will guide you through the discussion and introduce our social entrepreneurs on the panel today. Over to thank, you, Saul. Thank you, Monica. Very excited to be here today. Excited to also have our four amazing panelists who have the discussion to understand a bit more about the social procurement and their practices behind the social procurement. But before jumping into that, I also just wanted to really think about what exactly is the val uh, value of the social procurement. And I would like to look at, uh, look at the value of social procurement, perhaps from the three perspectives. Number one, from investors' perspectives, uh, number two, from the large corporations, and the third, not the but last but not least, from social business side. So as an investor myself, it's quite an easy answer for me to give it to you. It gives us a huge level of comfort. The reason is because it shows that business model is scalable. The social business can also diversify the source of income from different segments of client. They can diversify the clientele and whatnot. And number two reason for the investor also is because it shows that company itself has the discipline or will be able to build a discipline to do a rigorous uh, business planning, financial planning, and also manage the cash flow to actually execute those large uh, contracts with the large corporations. And also as a debt investor myself, we, the letters of intent or even just existing partnerships with the corporates shows that they have, they could potentially serve as a collateral. And that is a particular interest of, um, let's just say debt investors 
if the company itself doesn't necessarily have any other assets to be like, collateralized. And moving to the corporate side, if we look at what is really the value of the social procurement for corporates, I think it really shows the intentionality, ability, and willingness to generate the social impact. And secondly, I think it's a great exercise for them to really incorporate the social impact or environmental impact into their business making processes, as well as, you know, some parts of the core business operations they have. And also the third reason is because they offers this competitive advantages against his peers who is not necessarily doing the social procurement. And moving to the social business side, I, I was trying to be really creative to see, you know, what are some of the benefits for the social businesses? And I, I kind of just, let's just say, combine three benefits into three R's. So the first R will be revenue. Second R will be recognition. And the third R, I think is a bit of stretch, but let's just say it's a reassessment. Revenue side, obviously, those corporates will generate the contract with the large corporations will generate revenue. But to me, that is slightly beyond just a one-time revenue. It could be recurring. That volume could also go very significantly larger over time. And also thirdly, they could also potentially attract additional contracts with similar like-minded corporates. Second recognition is the fact that you can actually obtain those contracts with large corporations is a recognition to the quality of services you provide, uh, quality of the goods you provide, and it so, um, to a certain extent, it verifies, validates the business models and the thinking behind the social businesses. And the third one, the reassessment part, it actually helps these social business to, let's just say, take a moment to revisit their business model. Am I doing everything right? Is there something else that I can improve based on the requirements, based on the interactions you have with the large corporations? So those are some of the things that I think are, of course, they are not the um, everything, uh, but they are some of the value of the social procurement from investors' perspectives, from large corporations, as well as from social businesses. Of course, we, we just learned about, let's just say, I think everybody's quite clear in the value of the social procurement. Then it leads to the next question is exactly how do we do it? Um, it's great that we have four amazing panelists who have been in this journey of the social procurement for a long time. So I would like to now, uh, without further ado, introduce four amazing panelists here today. So I would like to first start from Mafu Sai from Jordan River Foundation. He is the director of the social enterprises. What I liked about his background, and I actually really like his Zoom background as well, is that he brings the years of experiences in the FMCG restaurant and food industries, and now to culinary arts and handicrafts that you see on his Zoom background to support the communities of females, Jordanians, and refugees to become financially independent. I'm not going to talk much more about the business model. I, I just wanted to introduce my food, and then we can also uh, jump into other questions later to learn more about how they, uh, you know, how does Jordan River Foundation functions and their work with the social procurement. Moving to Lea El Hashem from SE Factor Lebanon. Lea combines the human resources management and business development and strategy in her role. She's an enthusiastic tech uh, recruitment associate at SE Factory, and she aims to reach a 90%, 90% uh, employment success for all the graduates as, at the SE Factory. And now moving to Africa, we have Kieran Smith from Mr. Green Africa. Karen is a serial entrepreneur with more than decades of experiences building impactful businesses. He's passionate about creating social, environmental, and economic value through businesses. And he's successfully doing so as a co-founder and CEO of Mr. Green Africa, which is a plastic recycling company based in Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya. And moving to uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Ber uh, Bermudez is from Amalitech. She has combined her interest in intercultural cooperation, business, and international politics as a business development, uh, development at Amalitech. She's passionately working now to create sustainable jobs in Ghana and Rwanda and help to create new opportunities in these two countries. So now I think I would like to perhaps start with, you know, understanding how do we actually obtain those contracts and maintain those contracts? And I think it could be, I would like to perhaps start with Kieran here. Um, Kieran, for your experience at the Mr. Green Africa, how did you first get in touch with your current corporate clients and what was the process? Can you walk us through? Yes. Hi, everybody. Thank you so, so much for the introduction. And um, just on a side note, I think, 
I should take you along to my fundraising tour when it comes to credit, uh, explaining the value that investors will get. Um, so very well put. Um, when we touch on what it requires or how did we get access to a contract with Unilever, um, of course, it's a long journey. So um, it started really with them finding us. Um, I don't have the long story, but because of time, but the short story is really about us being invited into kind of a work st- workshop session, participating in, in, in stakeholder meetings about the waste management problems with corporates, with NGOs, et cetera. And as we were presenting our approach that is has the sustainability aspect of it, has the, the, the quality aspect of it um, in integrating ourselves in the value chain uh, from a plastic recycling perspective, it made the Unilever um, folks really interested in working and collaborating and exploring with us how they could um, buy post-consumer recyclate and and use it in their value chain, right? So that's how the journey started. Um, And I would say say the journey took us around 24 months from the first contact uh, with them and, and also be mindful we were a startup young company. We wanted to go fast and quick and they were big company and it's more slow in decision making right and get all the stakeholders on board because if you truly want to get into um these these corporate supply chains and become a vendor the key things that we had to learn are that you need to talk to procurement team you need to talk to the r&d team because we're it's not that recycled content is largely available on on this planet, and uh, despite the fact that it is even um, inclusively purchased and, and transparently purchased, so there's a lot of hurdles um, to overcome from a quality perspective because brand owners they don't want to compromise um, their quality, right? They, they, the belief is that same quality, um, more fair inclusiveness, they can integrate. So R and D team keep keep part, and of course then the sponsors, the the big. Um, the, the the managers who who lead different departments divisions etc who really are keen to to integrate the story the narrative of what they want to achieve in a sustainable and big way um so those factors they took us 24 months to check off um and get to a point where we were able to together launch the first product um in Kenya made out of 100% recycled material that was locally collected empowered for the waste picker community, locally recycled in our factory to turn it into high quality recycled material and bring it back into their packaging through their local converters. So many stakeholders, but it's worth the effort as explained by yourself, uh, hits the revenue, hits a recurring revenue. And of course, uh, gives us the ability to tell the story that it's possible to do so and uh, onboard other brand owners such like Unilever. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. And what year, let's just say, I know you mentioned it was quite early stage at the moment that Unilever approached you. What, what uh, let's just say, in how many years of operation were you in when you were first contacted by Unilever? And the second yes. question is, there's mm-hmm. still quite a lot of, you know, I, I know quite a lot of still, let's just say, plastic recycling companies in Kenya as well. What made Unilever particularly interested in Mr. Green Africa? Sure. So uh, I think first time we engaged with them was mid-2017. That was like our first interaction point. Um, and the launch of the actual product was um, yeah, late 2019, early 2020. So and, and what stood out for Mr. Green, I think, because... Um, you know, we don't consider ourselves to be a recycling company. Yeah? Um, we're a fully integrated um, circular plastic, local circular plastics economy. Yeah. So what we want to do is not just recycle a product. We want to focus on actually uplifting from waste to value. And, and, and that takes quite some effort. And because we were early on and just not just organizing the collection, making it fair, making it transparent, we also were very early on heavily involved in the manufacturing side of, of, of things. What you see in many recycling companies in the, in the global south, they, they, they have to deal or struggle with three businesses. We always joke in, in the Mr. Green Africa team that we had to build three businesses in one. We had to build the business of collection, 
that is fair, that is transparent, that is scalable, replicable. We had to build the business of manufacturing, turning waste into value with all the different machinery and, and processes that you need to go through to get to high quality material. Mm -hmm. And we had to build the business of engaging brand owners, partners to understand the value of transparent value chains, the value of local high quality recycled material that they can use in their packaging and so on. So going through these processes um, really, I think, because we did it early on, enabled us to do it with Unilever uh, as, as the one party, because there was not many parties were thinking like that. That's great. So what Unilever also offered is not just a revenue, but also to restart, you know, the restructuring the business model, how to integrate into the value chain of that plastic waste management. And, and what you mentioned the biggest hurdle was qualities. Was there any other challenges that you didn't foresee, but throughout the discussion with Unilever that you realized there's something else we need to look into? Well, just time. <laughs> time was the biggest challenge. I mean, because this is making such decisions also for Unilever, big decisions, right? Uh, switching from virgin to recycled material, you don't know, will your packaging be consistent enough and will it do the job for the consumer, etc. So it is a big swing also for the brand owners and, and having that confidence into the into a company like ours and, and the, the showing the setup, showing the reliability um, takes time. And that, that time factor, I think, took us quite a while to, to acknowledge that it's just part of the process. Got it. Thank you so much. Now that we have learned from Kieran about how do you get it started, I also then like to move to Miss uh, the Jordan River Foundation Mafuz. Could you tell me, you know, I know that you have this partnership with IKEA for a little, I think, little less than a decade now. And how do you, you know, you have been with them for quite a while. Once you, I think to me, starting point is always contract. But that's also not the biggest hurdle. The biggest hurdle continues in the sense of how to maintain that contract, how to maintain that relationship. How did the Jordan River Foundation manage that process? Well, uh, thanks, Sol. Um, it was not an easy ride, to be honest with you. I mean, when we started back in uh, around 2017-18, uh, we had some challenges to change the mindset. We are, at the end of the day, Jordan River Foundation is a non-for-profit uh, organization, and there are certain set of rules and regulations that need to be followed within the foundation. And to be able to accommodate a big deal such as an IKEA project, we had to do some uh, tweaks here and there, uh, and we continue to do so. Uh, the volume increased. Uh, we started with 25,000 pieces. Now we export to IKEA around 350 pieces a year, 350,000 pieces a year. So that the volume, I mean, is uh, 10 times, 10 folds what it started. That brings it with it, with it brings several challenges. The, the most important thing is the transparency between us and IKEA. I mean, we do have some challenges. We are we never hide behind them. We go directly to IKEA and tell them this is the challenge we have, whether it is uh, on the regulations and the I way and the I must, which are uh, regulations and audits that we need to abide to with IKEA, or whether, whether it is the social impact of the whole project. I mean, you know, the project itself uh, works and uh, hires uh, Jordanian and refugees alike. So uh, with that comes several challenges. We get refugees from camps who would come to the center to work on the project. We send some, some of the work to their homes to be done at their own uh, time. So all of these bring some challenges. And we had to tweak certain things from our side and even from IKEA, because with IKEA, it was a no in the beginning to have the, the artisans work from their home. Now we have, we have set certain regulations where they can work from home, but we have to monitor the work environment they're working at. So we took on, uh, JRF took on their behalf that we fix their home environment. If there is not enough light, we provide that. If there is the, any um, issues with their work surrounding, we uh, do, do the changes to fix that so that I, IKEA would accept them working out of home. So many challenges, uh, but the key is transparency. 
we never hide, hide behind, behind those challenges. We would go directly to IKEA and we'd just tell them, we have one, two, three, how can we do that? And how can that not affect the cost at the end of the day for them and for us? The key is always the transparency. I, I agree. I think at the end of the day, as an investor myself as well, that we, we always will look into financial statements, but also understand, is that really transparent? Is there any other stories that I'm, we're missing other than just numbers? But I think also, I'm quite curious to learn from you in terms of what are some of the things that IKEA cared about that you didn't actually expect? Like, for example, you know, with IKEA, child labor is a major issue. So, uh, for example, we would just tell them that we do not employ any uh, uh, underage people in the whole project. But that was not enough to them. They wanted to make sure that the artisans themselves have their kids enrolled in schools. So it is not them being under child labor that they do not, they do not send their children to work under age. So every artisan that works on the project needs to provide schooling records of her kids. Can you imagine? So we had to go to that uh, aspect so that we make sure that we do not, a child labor by itself is not something uh, as being part of the project. So this is an example, uh, So uh, it, it seems like the scope of work has actually quite increased significantly, if I look at it. You not only need to also fix their working conditions for the artisans, you also need to provide the schooling programs for the children. How did you manage that? Because when you pitch, it wasn't, you weren't thinking about all those two aspects. You no, increase your workload. Yeah, of course not. But I mean, we managed, we had to. Uh, and, and we were very clear with the artisans and any of the, uh, any of the ladies working on the project that you need to make sure that your kids are in school, enrolled in, uh, of course, public schools, but they are enrolled and you do not have any, or there is zero tolerance for child labor. And if we knew, because there are certain audits, so if uh, an IKEA auditor comes to uh, Jordan and visits one of those uh, artisans at their own home and finds that the environment is not right, and uh, that he, they hear of any child labor in the background, then that's a, that's an audit failure, and that will cause us to stop uh, production. Makes sense. And, and knowing what you know now about what IKEA cares about, what are maybe the third component uh, to further increase our workload, but to provide more social impact? What are some of the things that you also have it in planning stage? Uh, I mean, currently we are we are looking for another client other than IKEA. Uh, IKEA would like uh, uh, their their business with us to only represent fifty percent of our capacity. Uh, I think we at Jordan River Foundation are ready now to take another client. Uh, we are aggressively looking to see a poten potential collaboration with any corporate that is focusing on uh, social procurement. Uh, this is a hot topic at this stage everywhere in the world. So we get interests, but nothing has been materializing so far. But this is our aim. Uh, this is what we're looking for at this stage, to continue with IKEA uh, and to find another uh, corporate uh, that we could replicate the IKEA model with. Got it. Thank you so much. Now that we learned about how do you start the procuring the contracts with the large corporations and also to maintaining. I also then like to move to SA Factor Lebanon and Miley Tech to learn more about other additional challenges you have, you know, process of actually working in corporates. So perhaps we can start with how would you say some of the cultural differences that you have encountered to work with large corporations that, first of all, you maybe foresaw it, but it got, let's just say, more challenging over time or whatnot. And, and what are some of the cultural differences, number one, with the working with large corporations and solutions? How did you overcome those challenges? Perhaps let's start with Elizabeth. Yes, thank you, Sal. Um, yeah, I think it's, there's actually two kinds of um, challenges that we had in this direction because one, it's always a bit harder as a startup, we are still pretty young. We have been founded in 2019 to uh, work with bigger companies. That is on one hand, the thing that you kind of have to adapt to the processes. It helped us also on one hand, obviously, as Mafus already mentioned, that we kind of have to adapt to their audits, 
enter their criteria that they would give us to to become a supplier and that in one case has also been a challenge obviously because it needs a lot of time it needs a lot of resources and work but on the other hand it was it would obviously lead us to become more professional professionalized in in what we do and one example would be for example getting the um, iso certifications um um, for example, at the moment, we are talking a lot to the automotive sector, and this has led us, for example, to uh, get the TISEX certifications and what we are, that's what we are in the process of right now. Um, so it always has two sides. It's always a challenge. It provides, it asks for a lot of, of time. It asks for a lot of resources that you also often don't really have as a small startup and the social business because Personnel cost is something that you obviously need to keep keep lower, uh, and yeah, this has been one of the of the challenges that we encountered. Great, thank you so much. And Leia, any challenges that you you know saw, and how did you overcome those? Yeah, similar by the way to Elizabeth's response, our main challenge when it comes to the corporate style companies. And since we supply companies with right talent that fit their cultural and their technical aspect of the job, one main challenge was basically the timing and the lengthy recruitment process that corporate or bigger company follow. So at us effectively, we have more than 190 hiring company, uh, hiring companies, and their sizes ranges between startups and big corporations. And we always notice that big corporations take more time to hire and to select the right candidate than startups because startups can choose the, the talent uh, by following like a one-step or two-step hiring process. Whereas when it comes to the corporate and to the big companies, they are looking for like multiple uh, opinions and multiple hiring process, uh, 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 hiring stages for the talent. So to overcome this challenge and to be fair with all our partners, we came up with a solution and we told our students that you cannot accept any job offer before seven days, uh, sorry, after, uh, after seven days from graduation. So you need to wait seven days to give uh, fairness for all our partners to get the chance to meet you, to go through their hiring processes, regardless of the lengthy or the time they need to uh, to select the right candidate. I, it seems like I think we have some keywords here. It's always the time and the resources as well. And, but I, I'm also quite curious because of that. You know, working with the the fact that you're working with large corporations has that also affected your business model? Did that also help you to evolve your business model because of your work with corporate partners? Yeah, uh, actually, yes. Uh, since uh, like uh, big companies usually are looking to hire more than one or two talent or even sometimes like they hire in bulk. So which needed actually some kind of discounts or some kinds of special pricing to meet their expectations. So that's why we also introduced another like benefit for the companies that are looking to hire in bulk. And we are now like able uh, to provide them with a special discount only if they hire more than three talent per batch. Uh, that was like uh, something that we could change uh, in our business model. And by the way, throughout the years, we, we implemented and we could actually uh, evolve our business model. So back in 2016, when we first launched, it was a totally free of charge business model. And we provided our services without actually charging the companies. And when companies notice that we are like offering quality people and we are offering good talent, they were willing to pay uh, as effectively a fee once we place a good talent in the, in the companies. And like no one nagged actually about introducing a business model because they were super satisfied with the actual outcome and with the actual talent that we were providing. Makes sense. And also, Elizabeth, given the fact that Amali take actually operates in both Rwanda and Ghana, I'm, I'm thinking there's like two layers of cultural differences perhaps could come in. It's just one is to work with the large corporate, 
but also help them to understand the two different operating environments. How did you manage that process? Yeah, um, so Ghana has been existing for quite a while now. We started operating there in uh, 2020 and uh, WANA only joined actually last year. So this is still pretty new. Um, so far, the people have been quite open to both options. And when we talk to corporations, it's more about the general um, topic of what will it do working with uh, countries in Africa? What will be the differences uh, culturally between the people? Um, what is the different time zones? And those kind of concerns in general also are the country stable. That is also something that always comes up. And how is the education there? Those would be the, the general questions. Um, just to, to give some context, we basically provide after training uh, people in Rwanda and Ghana in the software development areas. We provide them and integrate them with our customers here in the German-speaking area in Europe. And so we have always this kind of intercultural topics. And what we like to do is just set up some workshops in the beginning and just get everyone together, the team leads on the customer side and the developers on our side and some of the management people get them in a room and just discuss openly everything. I think as we mentioned before, transparency is, uh, and relationship building is uh, the most important thing in this area. And it is just about basically bringing the people together and get them to talk about everything that is going on and just being really open with um, with what is going on and if there are any challenges. I think one one thing in Rwanda and in Ghana has been that they are not used to the really open feedback culture that we have a lot uh, here, especially in, in Germany. And so that has been a challenge for some of our people. But we also give them kind of the soft skill training where we kind of explain how, how people here function and how corporations here function. So that, that has really helped a lot. Thank you so much. And I think I would like to just ask, you know, open up the floor to all the panelists here. I wonder, because we talked about the time, transparency, resources, when is a pr appropriate time for um, companies like yours or, you know, fellow companies to fellow peers who are looking into social procurement, when is the best timing to start? Can I start as soon as possible or should I just kind of learn, understand the priorities of the businesses? And when can we start? What is the appropriate time to start given the fact that it takes long? You also need to go through a lot of the compliances, understand what they want, tweak here and there, provide a very transparent conversation. When is the best timing to start this? Um, maybe I can quickly start with some inputs um, and and also build on on what has been asked and, and said before, uh, I think a very critical part is that you focus inwards. You know, like being process driven and and focus on the core of the business of what is it that you really want to achieve, the inclusiveness in your supply chain, uh, more democratized uh, value chain, um, salary, whatever it is that it has your social angle. In the business, it's really important to link this with um, core processes of the business, be process driven, and the rest will follow on its own, you know, so I would really discourage to change a process just because there is a corporate, yeah, focus on what is the process for you, what is the most efficient process for the business, what is at the core, what do you stand for, and once that is all aligned and set up, a corporate will automatically see the authenticity in your business. You know, uh, and I think that's the first key question to to ask. And then, of course, when doing the business planning, when doing the hiring, one needs to take into consideration the time it can take, the stakeholders one needs to talk to, um, the pipeline you need to build, um, because not all corporates are at the same page in terms of how they want to engage with a social procurement uh, vendor, for example, right? Some are more advanced, some are behind, some... They say they want to do it, but they really don't know how to do it. Um, and, and so being able to, when you focus on your own process and your own setup and, and be business-minded, obviously, that gives you the sustainability, the authentic, 
the authentic stakeholders will recognize that and will support you where they can. There's a lot of support on the table because uh, it's a win-win situation. The quicker you are in their value chain, um, the better for them. And if you basically, your success is their success. Yeah, And uh, keeping that in mind, it removes a bit the pressure of, I have to do this because they asked them. Also be um, encouraged to say no. Some things you can't just do yet. Uh, you'll be committed to do them, but you can't do them now. So if they see your boundaries, they also it also gives you a bit of seriousness um, on how to work with that partner. Just don't bend backwards and um, do everything they ask for because sometimes they don't even know what they're asking for. And if, if you stay true to your core of the business, be process-oriented, I think you get all the elements, the core elements that you need to start plugging into these value chains. No, that's, I think that's absolutely right. Just ask yourself, what exactly are you trying to achieve? Why do you need them? What is exactly the reason you set up this social enterprise? Any other um, thinking or thoughts here? I, I would like to add, so one thing is that once you do the agreement, once the agreement is in place, you need to deal with it with a business mindset. It, if you want it to continue, it has to be dealt with as a business mind, with a business mindset, not forgetting the social part of it at any time, but the business mindset needs to be part of the whole program so that you can sustain it and continue to grow in it. This is, this is what I would personally add to that. I would also add that uh, the business aspect of the job that, Mah that Mahfouz just mentioned is also related to the quality. So even if you're like doing a social business or you're seeking like uh, uh, to help people while doing the business, you should never like sacrifice the quality because businesses are actually and corporate are actually interested in the quality and want to hire or to buy or to procure or to to get on board quality people or quality product so they will never sacrifice the quality only to support people so by combining both is the actual like uh, real success that you can do anything to add from you elizabeth Yeah, I think uh, I fully agree. It's just keeping keeping your mind on those two things, having the quality and not forget about the social aspect and just reminding them of what, what they are doing with you so they will be there to support you. And I think just also keep your mindset on like not being intimidated by those big corporations. In the end, you're dealing with people at the first hand and I know there are a lot of processes and a lot of reasons probably not to do it. But I think you just can't be too afraid of them and just face them on, on the same eye level and just do a pilot project, get started, take the risk and, risk, and then it will be worth it in the end. Makes sense. That's, I think that those are very great advice to the fellow entre uh, entrepreneurs who are seeking to do social procurement for large corporations. Kieran, you mentioned briefly, you know, they don't seem to also know what, exactly what they want. What are some of the advice, based on your interactions, maybe to all two panelists as well, what are some of the advice can we give it to them, to those corporate procurement managers, how to make your life easier, how to make the social procurement, let's just say, a more pleasant journey that you can have as a starting point? Well, I mean, this goes to the top of the organization. You know, this is CEO level stuff for the big corporates. If that is, if that element um, is not being taken seriously and just kind of like as a CSR um, project within the business, it will not fly. Um, and one anecdote to this is uh, we had, I mean, in this process of um, being able to, to engage with the Unilever leaders uh, on, different, on different levels, on the continent, in the country, but also globally, having that exposure is very critical because when they see that something is tangible, They'll sponsor and they'll they'll push their teams to really make it happen. And and for us, and a key unlocking part was when Paul Pullman was still part of the 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 was still the CEO of Unilever um, at that time. He came to visit our factory and he saw what we were doing and he said, "When can I expect a product in shelves?" And everybody had to commit there and then. 
to get it done. Um, and that accelerated things, right? So it really, this commitment comes from the top. Um, and as a procurement officer, as an R&D officer uh, within the large organizations is, is really looking where's the guidance and the strategy in the top, how serious does this leadership mean it? And then really focus on the touch points that what of the strategic objectives of this organization over five years, 10 years is leading into achieving that, right? And if those touch points are really in sync, I can guarantee to be bold because sometimes it's also the, the decision to be bold as a as a employee within a large organization. You don't want to stick your head out. You want to you don't want to say, "Oh, this organization I, we need to work with," because you don't know there are risks with it too. Because if it fails, your head is on the on the on the on 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 the plat platter, right? So, um, if there are these strategic objectives, if you feel that there are um, the leaders are really serious about it. I think it's important to be bold and, and just stand up for the partners you're working with or have interacted with. Um, and once you do that, I think the rest will take care of itself. Any other thoughts from the panelists based on your interaction with the large corporations? What advice can you give it to them? Yeah, um I would say that a lot of times also small businesses are, uh, as social businesses are a lot of times also small businesses. And um, so this would also mean that um, topics such as liability, reporting standards, and all those kind of things that big corporations demand when they are trying to list you as suppliers, just do not apply in the same way as their other suppliers that are a lot of times bigger. And so it would be great to have other criteria, other processes, maybe also simpler processes that will go a lot faster because as I mentioned before, also resources are kind of short and small in social businesses. So I think um, adapting the processes to get listed and to become a supplier and then be able to scale up faster also in the later process, that would be um, a really helpful thing to social businesses. Hmm. So actually, I see a quite a relevant question here. Perhaps that could also be answered by either Leo or Mafus here. So Lars is asking, are multinationals asking the suppliers to adopt and practice anti-corruption compliance system? And how do you demonstrate this compliance? So I think that could also go beyond other compliances. How do you, do they ask for this kind of practices? And it does take a long time to build this. How do you demonstrate such a compliance? Person. Our case, we never yeah. dealt, by the way, with such uh, like compliances or such cases. However, I can say that um, whenever the business is fully compliant and is like uh, really uh, they are confident about the actual work being done and the processes and the like right work that is being done and completed, such policies can be easily uh, draft uh, can 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 be done or drafted. And they can like be followed if definitely the, the, the final client is worth the effort and worth like the drafting such rules. Yeah, and for, can for us, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Karen. Well, I mean, just a quick one. If you build on that, what, what Leah said, um, it's really about trust, right? And it's all being transparent. Um, so what we usually do is we invite, uh, doors are always open, anybody can come. Um, and of course, we show how we train our employees, our personnel, how they can navigate through the different policies that we have adapted as a, as a business, right? Um, and, and it's just like any other successful business. If you want to have a policy trickled down all the way to the person on the ground working every day in, in, in the fields, um, it's all about training, awareness, inclusion, reminders. And, and, and if you can demonstrate these processes as a business, um, there's a lot of confidence that your partners have, right? And it's not in their only, you shouldn't do it just for their interest. This is also in your own entity's interest to be compliant within those processes, right? So all these processes and these demands, they they, they come for with a reason. And I agree 
there needs to be a balance or to what Elizabeth was saying. There, there needs to be a balance of the demand. It can be staged. You know, you can't start at 100, but you can start somewhere. You can start with a very basic policy and, and, and approach on how you, you, you communicate that and engage your, your team members in it. And then you grow. Um, I think it's all about the journey. And if your partner, if your customer sees this journey um, with the value, with the benefit, they're very accommodating. And, and where there are gaps, when there are gaps, they're very accommodating in helping you to close these gaps. That's what we've seen in the past. And it has worked really well for us. It accelerated our professionalism in the entire business tremendously. Uh, for, for us at JRF, it was a bit different because we are already an NGO. We are a royal NGO and anti-corruption policies are already in place. So we didn't have to in invent anything or apply anything that's new. I mean, we had it as part of the culture in the foundation. So that was not a challenge from our side. So. Great. Thank you so much for all the insight that you've been sharing. I think I already feel that, you know, it's not just a passion that I'm feeling from you guys, but also getting to know how you actually obtain the social procurement without really compromising, but really stick to the core of what you're trying to achieve in terms of the social and environment impact. And that is absolutely inspiring. And I think I would like to perhaps just ask all four panelists one more time of what is like the one thing that you wish everybody in this room can have a takeaway from what is the one thing that you like to deliver as a very important message i can start if you want so uh yeah actually i will summarize my answer by stating three keywords which are be consistent uh, listen well to the clients and finally tailor your offerings to meet and to support uh, the actual needs I can go next. Uh, uh, I, I always say that deal with it as a business, but don't forget the social impact part of it because it is very important. I always repeat this story and it makes me shiver whenever I say it. Uh, one of the ladies that has been working on the project for the past two years comes to me one day and tells me, Mahfouz, I just want to tell you, since I started working on that, on this project, my husband stopped beating me. That impact of social, imp the social impact that's happening in those families and how we are empowering those artisans to become a vibrant and important part of their family and their households is unbelievable. To me, nothing matters about beyond this one. The whole, the whole project doesn't matter when I just hear that and I know that there are several others with similar stories. So deal with it as a business, keep the social impact and you're, you're, you're on top of it. Yeah, I think for me, it's basically what, what I already said earlier, just go out there and do it. Social procurement will offer your company big, big benefits in the end. And for me, it's also just as Mafu said, like when you hear the, the stories of, of the people you work with, that will always bring you the motivation in the hard times. And when you, you are struggling with some complications or challenges and just, just go ahead. Good. Uh, it's hard to top all of this. Um, but if I would focus on the three different stakeholders that might be in this room. So for the investors, key message, you have heard the time elements. So if you come across a social business, this is why you're an investor. You can bridge that gap with financing and that time gap uh, and enable more of social businesses. Um, for fellow entrepreneurs, yeah, be bold, stay to your core, do it for your own cause and for your own organization. The rest will follow. Um, and for the corporates that it might be there, I think it has been said, um, be realistic of what can you expect from the different social enterprises, support them where you can, make bold decisions, big swings, and we'll have uh, social procurement becoming the new norm uh, in this world hopefully. Great. Thank you so much. I think we learned so much from you guys today. And, and I'm curious to hear from perhaps also from Monica as well as that, 
you know, we are hearing from what um, companies have been doing. We also, YSB is also as an investor, we have worked on this um, proc social procurement quite a lot. For Monica, especially for your day-to-day -day work, you interact with corporates quite a lot. What can we do from here? Where is, should we, what should be our ne next action item? And how can we learn more about the social procurement? Yeah, I think events um, like today um, are already a very great next step um, in terms of what, what corporations need to make social procurement work. The very first step is being aware that this is a possibility. Um, to me, the beauty of social procurement is that it's not philanthropy, right? Uh, corporations buy what they need anyways. Uh, they buy raw materials from you, they buy services, they buy products. This goes directly into their value chain. So they really need what you have to offer as social businesses. They just get, just quote unquote, get the impact um, on top of that. So it's really about being aware that this is a possibility. So what we, what you did today, what we did together today is making that scene, uh, making corporate procurement managers aware that you are out there, you're ready to supply to them. You are a professional businesses. You might need some help here and there, um, but that's true for all or for most um, small and medium-sized businesses who want to be suppliers to corporations. But the social business economy is ready uh, to supply to corporations. So that's a very important first step. And next step is what you also showed today. Be bold, be transparent, and be flexible. Um, and you all, you all told um, your stories of how you actually implemented all of those qualities. The same is, of course, true for corporate procurement managers. We heard a lot about due diligence and about anti-corruption and about all those processes are super important. They are very important for corporations. We all know about the scandals that um, happened in the last few years and that are also still happening today. So corporations are thankfully taking that seriously today. Um, but that can mean that you face a lot of red tape and bureaucracy and um, processes can take a long time and can be very confusing and you need all sorts of numbers and processes have to be navigated. Um, and sometimes also, uh, and we heard that from you as well, the, the culture can be a different one um, in terms of being a, uh, being a small, very dynamic, um, a young business that works with people on the ground and that has, you know, you see the, the stories that um, the impact that you create and the stories that we heard from you, uh, you're involved with that every day which is really great. Um, on the other hand, you have procurement managers who are responsible sometimes for, you know, a large sums um, who have um, many, many uh, colleagues who work in this uh, like a corporate environment. It's just, a very, it's a different kind of dynamic. And sometimes um, there can be misunderstandings and just cultural differences and also um, just, just gaps in terms of how do we approach each other. Uh, you cannot just open the telephone book or call your I don't know, local chamber of commerce um, to ask like, hey, can you please um, give me the number of uh, the social business that's close to me that can supply recycled plastic or um, where I want to source textiles from. That's just not the case. But that's uh, where intermediaries like us, like uh, YSB, come into place, who are close to the social business economy, but who are also uh, close to corporates and who can function as translators um, and as matchmakers between those two worlds. Because when you, when you look at it, um, and when both sides are flexible um, and really want to make it work, and when both sides are transparent about remaining obstacles, it's really not rocket science, as we heard from all of you. So um, I can only encourage um, all the social entrepreneurs who are um, in the audience today, um, as we heard, be bold, um, try it out, approach us, um, approach your fellow social entrepreneurs uh, who you heard of today or who are in your, uh, in your region, in your countries. Um, to all the corporate people who might also be in the audience, or if you know somebody who works at a big corporation, um, don't hesitate and ask them, where do you buy from? Who cleans your offices? Um, who uh, makes um, the textiles in your value chain? 
who supplies um, your digital services, for example. Have those conversations um, and just create awareness for the possibility um, that you can buy social. Um, that is a very important first step. And then after that, with a little bit of help and support, um, the social entrepreneurs and the corporates can really work together and really uh, create the transformation of the economy that we all want to see. Um, that being said, if you want uh, more specific input, um, I'm going to post the link to two reports uh, just here in the chat. Well, um, we work together with Acumen, um, another support organization from um, the social business economy. Um, let me see. Here. Um, and put together two reports. One of them that I just posted showcases uh, over 100 corporate ready social businesses from all over the world. Um, and the other one, uh, we did that from Uno Social Business and we call it the Social Procurement Manual. Um, and it really gives you um, the definitions again, uh, showcases best practices. Um, it has a lot of cases where you can actually see um, social procurement in action from very different spend categories, from very different regions. Um, it has success factors um, and it helps you to sort of do it step by step and navigate the challenges and opportunities of that. So feel free uh, to download those two reports. We're always happy to hear from you. Um, and I hope, uh, I'm, I'm sure I also speak um, for the social entrepreneurs here today. We're also happy to hear from you. So if you're interested in digital services and textiles and recycling, um, just reach out to them. Um, we're always happy to continue the conversation. Anything um, to add to that? Anything that I forgot uh, looking at my two colleagues here? Well, then, thank you so much, Saul, for moderating us today, for guiding the discussion. Thank you so much again, Joe, um, who's in the audience, um, for organizing all of that. Um, and, of course, thank you so much to our amazing panelists um, for providing us with insights today, um, for being here today, and for encouraging all of us on the journey of social procurement. And thank you very much to Sankalp uh, for having us today, uh, for hosting us and for providing everybody with the opportunity to share their insights and to, to learn together. Thank you very much.